So we've got Ephesians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21 that we're going to look at tonight. And we've got a couple of things to look at. Of course, I don't want to bore you all with, with some of the, the details, but I want us to look at, at a couple of, of things related to this. But it starts with verse 15. We start with, Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So they do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And so we've got a few things to look at. First of all, if you have an NIV, we'll start at the, the end and, and then go forward from there. If you have an NIV Bible and a couple of other Bible translations, they will have taken that last verse, therefore, and be subject to one another. Uh, and they will have put the be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And they will have put that with the next paragraph. You'll have a subject heading in between there that, that tries to tie out and say, okay, the next thing is about... Uh, you know, family relationships, and they put a separation. And there is a huge debate among Bible nerds as to whether or not it is appropriate to put be subject to one another out of fear of Christ with the paragraph before, like I just read it to you, or does it go with the next set of, of instructions that starts with wives submit to your husbands and the Lord. And we're not going to have that sermon tonight uh, because we've talked about that and, and you know, Besides that, so, no, I was about to say that certain people aren't here to hear it, so it doesn't do any good, but we won't go there. Um, but th that's a big debate, and that's a large discussion, and I think that part of our problem is we want to put subject headings in the middle of what was a long letter. How many of you have ever written a letter to somebody and put subject headings in it where you've divided it up? Anybody? You know, where you go through and it's like, all right, you know, and this is what I'd like to see. You know, you write a love letter. Or you write it, you know, even to, you know, a parent writing a letter to a child, straighten up. Whenever I got those letters from mom and dad in college, they didn't have subject headings. They probably should have, you know, there's this, there's this, and, you know, bullet points to make it stand out. Paul didn't write with subject headings. He wrote a long letter. More appropriately, he probably dictated a long letter that somebody else actually wrote, but that's another discussion. Uh, what we need to understand is that that first, we need to make sure, while those little subject headers in your Bible, for example, the next one above verse 22 for minds of marriage, like Christ in the church. Those subject headers are there to help you and to kind of give you some summaries and to guide you as you study the Bible. But those are not part of what we consider as uh, Christians and as Baptist believers that believe in, in the inerrancy or, or the always rightness of the Bible. Those subject headers aren't part of that. The bold print, here, and here, and here, and here, that's added by the translators to help break up the text because that's the way we would write things like this in English. So don't get hung up on, well, this one goes here and that one goes there. Don't even get too hung up on, this is where my paragraph starts. There are markers in the Greek that help you kind of guess where you would put an English paragraph. But they're not definite. Those kind of change depending on how you do the, the language. Paul tends to write sentences that if he were speaking in English would go on for about a page and a half. Okay, So he, he's, he's very structured. In fact, when you start teaching somebody, if any of you want to start learning to read the New Testament in Greek, we won't touch Paul's 13 letters for the first year that you study the, the Greek language. We, we, won't, we won't touch Paul at all. You actually start with John. 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And then you do John the, the, John the Gospel, and then you look at the other Gospels. And then you do Paul, and then you do Peter. And you can do 1st Peter before you do Paul, but you don't do 2nd Peter, because 2nd Peter, Peter has bad grammar. And so you can't learn to do Greek right if you start with Peter. It's like trying to learn English, hanging around with you know, some, people, some folks that, they, they ain't talking too good. And that's, seriously, when you read Peter, and when you read P, what Peter says in the Bible, go ahead and read it with a country accent, because that's Peter. He is a fisherman. He is a country boy at heart. I 
firmly believe that about Peter. Y'all, let's go fishing. That's, that's, when you read, when Peter says after the crucifixion and after the resurrection, he says, I'm going fishing, read that as y'all, I'm going fishing. That's just, read Peter. I, now, I may get to heaven and Peter may be upset with me for saying that, but that's the way, that's the way he is. Um, but Paul writes and all these, these things are extended out, so don't get too hung up on those subject headings. Well, this verse must go with this, and this verse must go with that. It all goes together from Ephesians 1.1 1, 1 through Ephesians 6.21. The whole letter goes together, and there, these things follow one thought after the other as Paul presents it, in the same way that, yes, you have points, for example, even in a sermon. This is point one, point two, point three. They're supposed to relate. Okay, when you have a good preacher, there's actually a connection between all those points. Okay, so y'all don't tell me where I fall on that scale. The next thing we need to do is look back at the beginning of this. Paul starts the sentence, we've got, therefore, be careful how you walk. Therefore means that you're supposed to do what I'm about to say because of what I just said. It's hot outside, therefore, come in into the air conditioning. It's hot outside, therefore, drink lots of water. I'm hungry, therefore, I will eat. These are the kinds of things that, you know, therefore, kind of fits in the middle of that. So when a sentence and a paragraph starts with, therefore, you've got to look back and see what that was about, why that is there. And so you can look back in that first part of chapter 5, even just look at verse 14. For this reason it says, talking about the scripture, awake sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Paul is talking about the grace of God and the, and the magnificence in the paragraphs and the chapters before and the magnificence and the greatness of God and how wonderful it is and how much of a blessing it is. It's in Ephesians that we get so clearly stated it is by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. You know, Ephesians is about the magnificent riches of God and it's, it's a great book. Paul says, because of all this, therefore, do this. Be careful how you walk. Not as unwise men, but as wise. Now start taking this one apart. Careful how you walk. Does, is Paul talking about, you know, make sure, you know, remember how to walk. Left foot, right foot. Left foot, right foot. That's not what he means. I mean, certainly Paul is not going to advocate that you go left, left, right. I'm not doing that again. Don't ask. <laughs> it's a long way down. He's talking about your manner of life. He's talking about the things that you do as you go through life. Your walk is your daily, daily life. Be careful how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Not as foolish, but as wise. We've got two options. And remember, he's addressing this to the church. This is a question that comes before believers. The lost world cannot help but walk in an unwise manner because they do not have the Spirit of God. They do not have the grace of God. They are still trapped in their sins. Does that mean that unbelievers can't do anything right? No, they can do good things. This world is filled with, with incidents of unbelieving people doing good things. A great many of them do good things in the hope that they'll earn God's favor, which Ephesians says you can't do. But down in, those good things fail to please God. Because what they are is then an attempt. It's a person coming before God and saying, instead of accepting Jesus dying for my sins, instead, Lord, I fed a million people. Is that not good enough? Well, it's great that you fed a million people. But compared to the death of Jesus, it's kind of an insult to say, take what I did instead of what you've done for me. Think about it. Those of you that have ever given gifts to somebody, they say, well, that's a nice gift, but instead, I'm just going to take and go get myself something instead of what you got. And that's what works are for. When we try to substitute works for accepting His grace and say, I'm going to do enough good to make God happy. That's saying, I don't want your gift. I'm special enough to, to live without it. Now, once you accept that gift of grace, if God gives you the ability and the way to find 
to feed a million hungry people? You ought to do it. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. And in fact, many of the people who have been instrumental over the years in making things like that happen did it because they saw the grace of God in their lives and they wanted to do good things for others to share the love of Christ with people. It is amazing the number of people, even to this day, when you see on the news that somebody's done this great one, oh, they're drilling wells and you know providing clean water here, or they're trying to rescue uh, modern-day slaves, or they're trying to, to fix this problem or deal with that problem, and then you discover if you can peel it back and get past the two minutes that the news will give them, you start peeling it back and you find out that it all started when they read their Bibles and said, ooh, we should do something about this. Walk as wise, not as unwise. Be aware of the things going on around you. An unwise person in that day is the kind of person who just walks into a trap. Just walking down the road, does not pay any attention. We were in Little Rock, downtown Little Rock yesterday, and they have the walk-don't-walk walk lights, which have evolved in my lifetime, because, first of all, they used to have words. It said walk, and it would say don't walk. And the walk was white, and the don't walk was red. And when the traffic, when it was about to change, the don't walk would start blinking, which we always translated to mean run, because it's about to turn solid red. Now, you get a picture of a person, white, to, make, to tell you, hey, walk. And then when it shifts, it doesn't just blink red at you, it gives you a countdown timer. 15. And it reads it out loud. You're standing there on the side of the street and you're 15, 14. I've watched enough thriller movies that I'm looking around for the explosives. And you know, what's, what's about to explode? But it counts down for you. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11. The unwise person waits for it to get to, to 1 and then tries to cross the street. And I saw a couple of those yesterday and they almost didn't make it. The wise person says, oh look, the light changed, it's time to go. Oh, the light's changed to red, let's just wait and not get hit by the big bus over there. Or in downtown Little Rock, you've got these trolleys, they don't stop for much of anything. Walk as the wise person that is aware of the things going on around you. Why? Because the days are evil. Making the most of your time because the days are evil. The things going on around you are evil. And folks, if you would like to think that today's world that you live in is filled with evil and wickedness and, and bad things, I will tell you this. We are on our way to matching the moral degradation of the Roman Empire. We are on our way to being as wicked and evil as they are. But we're not there yet. We're, we're, not, we're not as wicked and as evil and as messed up as a society as Rome was. And as Ephesus was and all the places over which Rome had influence and many of the surrounding kingdoms. Well, the, the things that we see in our modern age that we say, ooh, that's a moral failure. We're right. They are. There's a lot of things that go on that are a violation of God's standards of righteousness and holiness and justice goodness, but we don't hold a candle to Rome. We have problems and we have complaints about our government, whether it's you know, the mayor of Elmira, the county judge, the governor and the legislature of Arkansas, president, Congress, Supreme Court, whoever you've got a complaint with. We've got nothing compared to the idea of the way the Roman Empire worked, at least at the very least, if the president has a problem with somebody, right now all he's able to do is get the IRS to, to give you trouble. If Caesar had a problem with you, he sent the Praetorian guards to give you the option. Would you like us to kill you or would you like to kill yourself? Now imagine that, that the Secret Service could knock on your door simply because you had said something that the president didn't approve of and say, well, we're going to give you two options. You can kill yourself or we'll kill you. Now, if you kill yourself, we'll leave your family alone, but if we have to kill you, we'll kill your family too. That's Rome. We're not there yet. Those were evil days. Make the most of your time because the days are evil. Bad things are happening. Folks, the days are evil now too. You want to know why? Because we live in that gap between Jesus' ascension and His return. 
And there is an ever-growing separation, and there ought to be, between the people that are out to follow God and the people that are out to follow everybody else. <coughs> Just as every day there are millions more people that come to Christ around the world, every day there are millions more people who reject Him. Two billion people in the world, and, and you could question whether some of them rightly name the name of Christ. Two billion people claim to be followers of Christ. About five billion claim not to be. Folks, the days are going to be evil. Bad things are going to happen. Paul says, make the most of your time. What are you doing with it? He said, well, I have to go to work with most of it. We talked about that this morning. What do you go to work for? To be there to honor and glorify God for the things that you do at work. Remember that. You're not there to make money. You're there to glorify God. That God allows you to make money is how He provides you. So, don't be foolish. Know what God's will is. How do we know that? Well, He gave us a lot of instruction right here. So many times we hit, we hit our knees begging God, would you please tell me what you want me to do? It's already right here. Ann and I have been together. We haven't been married for 15 years, but this past weekend marked 15 years since we were engaged. And I, I don't have to come back to her and say, now what is it you want me to do? Because 15 years ago, you know, 14 and a half when you, when you actually count the wedding, we took vows to, to love, honor, cherish, forsaking all others for as long as we both shall live. Those are just some very specific things that I'm supposed to do. I don't have to ask her every day for a new list. Now what am I supposed to do as your husband today? Now, there are things that she can tell me to do to help. You know, we can vacuum, we can do the dishes, we can do this, we can do this. But her will for our marriage hasn't changed in 15 years. My will for it hasn't changed in 15 years. Those, responses, those things remain the same, ultimately. Know what the will of the Lord is. Start here. If you need some clarity on this, ask God to clarify. How, what does it mean for me? to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly before the Lord my God. Ask God to help you understand what it means in your life to make the most of your time and to live as a wise person. And then realize that the answer is frequently here. If you ask God what it is to live wisely and you've never read the book of Proverbs, then you're, you've skipped the answer. You've at least skipped the background work for the answer. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now that's an important verse right there, because that's about deciding what controls you. Do not get drunk with wine. Don't lose control over drinking wine. One would also argue that Paul intends anything that changes your ability and causes you to lose control of yourself. I would argue that Paul would certainly agree that you also should not get drunk with beer, and you should also not get drunk with whiskey and various other drinks, although those, none of those were invented at the time. So, you know, you had beer and you had wine. Those were your options. <coughs> Paul would agree that you should get drunk on absolutely nothing. You should not get drunk on anything. That's getting drunk on nothing. I guess is the wrong way to phrase that. You should not get drunk on anything. Because nothing should be in control of a believer except for the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit instead. Anything that causes you to be out of control of yourself causes the, edges the Spirit out for controlling your life is bad. Now, sometimes there are medications that we have to have for other things and other purposes that affect our ability to control, and that's another story. Those, should only, those, those things come between you and your doctor and pray, Lord, how do I, you know, what do I do with this? I have to take this heart pill or I will die. But when I take this heart pill, I get a little edgy. I don't feel like myself. My opinion would be take the heart pill, but that's not what Paul has in mind here. He's not talking about medicine. He's talking about recreation. He's talking about the things that we do just because, the things we do because we choose not to control ourselves. And being drunk with wine was a major problem because everybody drank wine at the time. That's what you drank at meals. Some people drank wine straight up. Some people mixed wine with water. 
to water it down, make the wine go farther, it also kept you from getting drunk on it. Paul's point is, there's a point that isn't up. And that point is where you lose control. Don't lose control. Because we're supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And some people would say, well, you know, does that, how much does that mean I can drink? If that's your question, it's the wrong question. The question is how much control do you want to see from the Holy Spirit over something else? If your question is what, I, what can I get away with, you're not asking a question of, of what, what glorifies God. Your question should be how do I glorify God with my life? That's your question. Because the answer is not, well, you can have one glass, but you can't have two. The answer is, at what point does your actions, do your actions stop glorifying God? Your actions should be about glorifying God in the way that you live. That's what the Scripture tells us that we ought to be doing. Don't be drunk, filled with the Holy Spirit. we got a choice, filled with the things of this world that deaden us to the evil days around us. Because that's why people would get drunk on wine, is to forget. In fact, the Proverbs even say that. You go back into the Proverbs and it says, look, it's not good for a king to drink wine. Give wine to people who have a terrible life so that they can forget their problems. That's what the Proverbs actually say. Chapter 29. Do we have a terrible life or do we have a grace-filled life? Should we be out to forget or out to focus on the Spirit of God? But that's why people would get drunk. Let's just forget everything. Let's be filled with this so that we can forget what, what so that we can block out the evil. Or do we want to be filled with the Spirit so that we can look at the evil and shine the light of Christ on it? And bring the message of the gospel. Because all that evil that's out there in the world, it's easy to spot it. That evil affects individual people one at a time. That evil affects individual people one at a time that we can encounter one at a time and share the love and grace of Christ with. And no, we cannot fix 10 million people that have this problem. We cannot fix 100 million people that have rejected God's truth. But we can build a relationship with one to share with them how instead of being drunk on wine, instead of being seeking the things of this world that make them forget, Instead, the Spirit of God can make them see greater things. And we can let that be what's most important to us. Because we will not save the world a million people at once. But we will one at a time. That one person, that friend, that family member, that co-worker, that bitter enemy down the street that you haven't been able to stand since high school. For some of us, that's been a long time since high school. Fortunately, none of mine are down the street. You have them on Facebook. You have to work on this. To share the love of Christ with Christ. Because the days are evil. But the people aren't. The people are just like us. Sinners in need of a Savior. We need to know where to find it. But how do we keep our courage up for that? How do we keep our wisdom up for that? This is where Paul says... Encourage one another. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. One of the things that you can tell, and this is what uh, a couple of friends of mine that are police officers have talked about, the, the way that they know the reason a police officer comes to your window at a traffic stop and talks to you and tries to get you to answer questions is because by your speech they can tell whether you're in control or something else is. And most of you that have ever known somebody with a substance abuse problem, you can tell by the tone when they talk. You can pick up the phone and call. I'm personally convinced this is one reason why text messaging is taken off in the world because you can cover it up. Easier. Although I have seen some text messages from people that show that you know, it eventually it gets to the phone too, but it affects the tongue pretty quickly. Are we going to talk like that, or are we going to talk driven by songs and hymns and spiritual songs? Where we glorify Christ in the things that we do and are reflecting what comes out of our mouth. 
that are reflected in the music that runs through our head, not against the silly songs that my children sing, like the shark song that I'm still trying to convince the girls to share with the church. Arlen, I think that they may need your help with that. Nothing wrong with the odd silly song or the great love song for, for you know, husbands and wives or the great parent to child song. So there's some beautiful ones out there. But we ought to be speaking to each other. That's supposed to be silenced. <laughs> Sometimes we speak to each other with little dinging bells and say, Preacher, it's about time. Wrap it up. We ought to speak to each other and speak among each other with pleasant things and pleasant words, encouraging words. And the music that runs through our head, we ought to drive to be the music that reflects the glory of Christ. And if your personal music style is, is rock and roll, you ought to find rock and roll that has words that, 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 that hold that to you. My favorite version of Onward Christian Soldiers is one that I'm yet to actually find a Baptist church that I think it would be okay in. But it actually, when they sing marching as to war, I'm actually, you're actually ready to go. It actually sounds like you want to go. Your style may be southern gospel. If it's got an offbeat, it may not be, it just may not be for you. You may be a, a four-part harmony person, you may be unison, you may be tone deaf. All of us who can't sing, it doesn't have to be good music and quality. It just has to sound good in your own head. Those are the things that stick with us. The soundtrack of our days on the come from the glory and the grandeur that is the grace of God. And this is what ought to matter to us. Be thankful. Subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Now this does not mean that you get to boss everybody else around and says be subject to one another. That doesn't mean, okay, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. I'm in charge here. Not what Paul's speaking of. Be subject to one another. We ought to look at one another and say, well, what are your needs and how can I serve you better? We ought to come together as God's people when we encounter fellow believers and look around and say, what are ways that we can serve each other better? The goal of the church is to be a place of service, first and foremost, to each other in the fear of Christ. How can I serve in the church? Our question shouldn't be as we come together, well, what can I get out of it today? What will this do for me? Well, what can I do for other people? What can I do for you? And we ought to come with that servant's heart and that servant's mentality ought to well up from inside of us, not because we hope to get something out of it, but because that's just who we are. As a reflection of Jesus who came, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for men. That's what he says in Mark that he came for what we're brought together for is to be there to encourage and strengthen each other because there are people out there that we are the hope that they have. Because without us, they don't hear about Jesus. Without us, they don't see that Scripture is true. They just see an old dusty book in a hotel nightstand. Without us, they only see the people out there whose opinion of the Bible is that if you don't like my Bible, I'll throw heavy rocks at you. And they don't see it as grace and love and truth presented by people who actually believe it and live it. And that's what we're here for. And if we're going to do that as we encounter the world outside and walk wisely with it, it's going to take us serving one another to have the strength to go through it. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. We pray, Lord God, that you will help us to see ways to serve each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come to the time in our service.